Uh, yes, this is an introductory lecture on History 1301. This is Nathan Giesenschlag. I'd like to talk to you today about the impulses of discovery and what helped bring Europeans uh, and bring them to the Western Hemisphere and help settle uh, and keep them in uh, what we'll call North America, in the future United States. So our story actually begins uh, before Christopher Columbus sells the ocean blue. For us, uh, we'll begin actually in years gone by, many, many years gone by, in fact. Uh, when we talk about the impulse to discovery, I think we ought to pick up with some just basic uh, Western uh, knowledge, Western historical knowledge, uh, that would help explain why the Europeans acted the way they did, and particularly the Spanish, who will be the focus of the lecture today. When we talk about the Spanish, it's first important to remember is, is that they are uh, geographically on the western edge of the continent of Europe. Uh, the Iberian Peninsula, which would include the Kingdom of Spain and also the Kingdom of Portugal, uh, face basically the Atlantic Ocean. It's almost like Portugal has a little bit of a nose uh, facing out into the ocean. Anyways, uh, uh, Spain particularly, and for that matter Portugal as well, will never be considered a blessed nation for natural resources. Unlike Mexico or unlike the United States or unlike other nations who will be blessed with either gold or silver or some other uh, precious natural resource, uh, wood, timber, arable land, and so on, uh, Spain is not going to have that. They are not abjectly poor, uh, which might either uh, break them completely or drive them into uh, modes of expansion or drive them into innovation, I should say. Uh, but Spain is not going to be confused with being a prosperous nation. And so Spain is, uh, I would say, prior to uh, Christopher Columbus's great work, uh, prior to that is going to be really what you could call a middling power, a middling nation, certainly not wealthy. It would be in the second rank at this point in time in its life, maybe third rank, certainly behind uh, Prussia, uh, especially behind the French, uh, probably on the same level with the English at that, this point in time. So we're, so we're clear, we're talking prior to 1492. Um, and so the Spanish, uh, the thing about the Spanish is that we need to talk about their psyche for just a second and what makes them. And really, when we talk about the Spanish, we're also going to talk about the conquistadors in another lecture uh, very soon. But what is it that makes the Spanish tick? Uh, the thing to remember about Spain is, is that Spain is going to be overrun, is going to be invaded in about the year 711. And so uh, Spain is going to be invaded in the year 711 by what uh, many of you know as the Moors. The Moors uh, are the particular historical name given to Muslims coming off of the North America, excuse me, the North African, uh, or the African continent, but North Africa, uh, and heading into and crossing the Straits of Gibraltar and heading into Spain. Now, when they do that in 711, it, uh, quite honestly, the Muslims had been uh, uh, rolling up great victory after great victory uh, from essentially the time when Muhammad takes off as a, uh, a warrior captain in addition to being a prophet. Uh, he and his followers, especially after, they di after he dies, are going to get off of the, Iberian, excuse me, the Arabian Peninsula, Saudi Arabia, uh, in modern terminology, basically. I know there are other nations on the Arabian Peninsula, but Saudi is the big one. Uh, but all that to say is, is that uh, the followers of Muhammad uh, not only create a great religion, but they also create a juggernaut that is political and military in design uh, that is going to uh, pose a real and grave danger to the heart of Christianity in what we call the, today the Holy Lands. They called it pretty much the same thing. Uh, but in Jerusalem... And that territory through there, those, uh, those churches will be upended. Uh, the great uh, Christian uh, city of Alexandria in Egypt, uh, which has been a, you know, an ancient city, it's pre-Christian, obviously, uh, but by uh, the mid, early to mid-700s, early 700s, late 600s, late 600s, early 700s, Alexandria was a hub of not only just uh, antique learning and uh, sophistication, uh, but it is a major wealthy Christian city. Of course, also the, the crown jewel in Christendom in that time period is not Rome. You may be thinking, isn't it Rome because of the papacy being there? And the answer is no, it's not. Uh, during the uh, 700s or so, uh, Rome was in eclipse. Uh, Rome was an unhealthy place, and we'll talk more about that in a later date. Uh, but the crown jewel of Christendom, uh, the, the great... Uh, 
this, we understand this about Christianity in this time period. It's not just a religion of the spirit uh, and the body, but it is also a religion uh, that also has political al- elements to it, or the, maybe the politics have the religion. Depends on how you see it, I guess. Uh, but the great city of Christendom was Constantinople, and today you know that is uh, Istanbul. Uh, Constantinople sits on the on basically on the, the Bosporus Strait. It's the, uh, the gateway into the Black Sea. Uh, it is the uh, kind of a choke point between uh, Asia and Europe and the great Roman emperor, uh, Caesar type, but it really, really an emperor at this point. His name was uh, Constantine in the early to mid 300s is going to build this great city and it keeps aggrandizing. Uh, Constantinople is the center of all uh, is center of all political power in the old Roman Empire, or what was left of it. Later, the Byzantine Empire. Uh, the Constantinople is, in its own right, a jewel of a city. It's it's uh, an ecclesiastical, meaning a church hub. Uh, some big, big churches. Saint Sophia uh, is there, and on we can go. But Constantinople is a major city, and the uh, Muslim tide washes up at Constantinople, and for a better part of about five to six hundred years is going to be checked until they can get past it. But our interest isn't so much out in the eastern <clears throat> parts of uh, Europe or for that matter the old Holy Lands, uh, but we're interested in Spain. Now Spain in about the year 700 is ruled by the Visigoths and they were, uh, they were Christian, yes, but they were particularly uh, 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 crude. Their Christianity did not include uh, uh, tenderness and too much mercy. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, the Visigoths were, uh, to my own reading of history, were generally disliked or despised by their subjects. And so that when the Moors cross the Strait of Gibraltar and start to roll up uh, the old uh, Spanish uh, uh, fiefs and kingdoms and such, they're basically going to be welcomed as uh, some sort of liberator. Now, I'm not going to say that they were throwing daisies in the pedal paths of the of, uh, Moorish uh, horses, uh, but, you know, sometimes the devil you don't know is better than the devil you do know. Well, uh, and the, the, the Moors, uh, they are piling up some impressive victories in Spain. In fact, uh, 711, uh, they do what they, uh, they take, uh, they start to take Spain. By 714, they've got enough of it, they can establish a capital at the city of Cordoba. And they change the name of Spain. They don't call it Spain. They call it, uh, especially amongst the more radical uh, elements of uh, revolutionary Islam to this day, <clears throat> they don't refer to Spain as uh, Spain. They refer to it as Al Andalus. So anyways, you, you've got all that going on. Uh, you can talk more and more about this, but to suffice to say is, is that Alan de Luz, a.k.a. Spain, and to also Portugal, but especially Spain because that's the focus of our lecture this morning, is, is that Alan de Luz is a, um, uh, it does afford some uh, status to those who aren't Muslim. So if you were Christian or Jewish and you lived in Al Andalus, Spain, uh, you had a second-class status. Now, there has been some debate over the years of how far did the liberties of a subject in Al Andalus go. From my reading of it is, is that it was not a just a to- it was not a tolerant society. And to be fair, I think it, it, for us in 2020, as I record this, to look back into the distant past and say they should have been more tolerant. Uh, yeah, I guess we can shake our finger at them, but at the same time, it was not a tolerant age. And so you have to be a little bit careful when you try to impose your values and your beliefs upon the historical past. Uh, you may say they should have done this, they shouldn't, and, and you can go so far with that. But they, generally speaking, did not uh, value tolerance as we would understand it, say, in a, an enlightenment sort of way. Uh, you know, peaceful coexistence between denominations and religions, and even, for that matter, those who believe in, in deity and those who don't. But all that to say, though, is, is that uh, a Christian or a Jew living in Al Andalus could live, but he had special taxes placed upon him. He had special restrictions on his worship. Uh, that you go on down the list, it's rather extensive. So it wasn't just a tolerant paradise, is my point. Uh, and uh, like any organization or any winner or juggernaut, at some point there's going to be, because they're human, uh, they're going to start seeing fractures and factions grow up within what seems to be a monolithic uh, movement. Uh, it was true for the communists in the 1950s and 60s. 
Uh, for the longest time after the Second World War, we Americans, many Americans, thought that the communists were monolithic, that they all thought the same way, they all fought the same way, they all um, believed exactly the same way, and that they all had a common goal, which we came to find out over time was just simply not true. They did. There was a great splits. Uh, famously, Richard Nixon in the 1970s. Uh, was able to drive some sort of uh, wedge between the Soviets and Russia and the Chinese communists under Mao uh, there in the mainland. The fact of the matter was is that uh, they were not monolithic. And, and what you far, start to find out in the 17, 720s, excuse me, and now 730s, is, is that Spain is, uh, the Spanish Moors, uh, they're factional. Uh, a lot of it has to do with power, uh, the, the old uh, worm in the apple of greed and power, uh, power for the more power, more greed, more uh, glory. Uh, and so you're going to start to see these different uh, princes and sultans. And basically my point is, is that leaders, uh, military leaders, political leaders, religious leaders, jostling for greater and greater authority in al Andalus. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they're stopped or they're checked, not yet anyways. And so by the year 732, and if you're wondering, do I uh, require dates? The answer is yes, I do ask you to, to take dates down occasionally. And if I make a big emphasis on a date, then that's probably a good uh, idea that you need to write it down and remember that date. And this is, I think, one of those. Uh, yeah, 714 would have been for uh, Cordoba uh, as a capital, but the bigger one, more important to me, though, is 7, uh, well, 711 when they invade, uh, but it's 732. And that is uh, what you need to put in your notes is the Battle of Tours, T-O-U-R-S. Another name to go in your notes, too, is a guy named Charles Martel. Now, Charles Martel is a, a Frankish, meaning early our ancient French king. He is a Frankish king, and Charles Martel, M-A-R-T-E-L, Charles Martel is not just a good general, which he is, uh, but he's also a great, uh, he's got a great political mind about him. He, he has the ability, and the great officers and the great chieftains, military chieftains can do this, regardless of de denomination, race, creed, whatever. Uh, they have the ability to kind of get in there, the, to get into the mind of their enemy, uh, to also just kind of have an intuit ability to anticipate what's going on, and frankly, just find out what, say, you know, what are the strengths and what are the weaknesses of your your enemy. And what Martel finds out and figures out through, to my understanding, is through uh, through just good old fashioned uh, gumshoe intelligence and having friends and and people who can tell you stuff. But old Martel figures out rather quickly that the, uh, the, um, the Moors are fractured over that issue of gold and glory and, and fame and, and so forth. Well, anyways, uh, Martel is able to sideline through agreements and through uh, uh, arrangements the, uh, some of these different princes uh, and basically says, look, if, if uh, I, in a sense, if I, if I uh, win, I'll help you out. I'll pay you and this sort of thing. And that should tell you that uh, for all the, the talk about religious solidarity, and there certainly was that at times in the, the, the great uh, Muslim conquest of North Africa, by the time you get to 732, it's fraying, it's, it's uh, splintering, and they, you can start to pair off this group and that group. It's not unusual, just as part of human nature, I would argue. Well, anyways, uh, what it does is it brings the odds down. And so for Martel, when he s finally sizes up and settle, uh, squ basically seizes up and goes after uh, the Moors in central France at the Battle of Tours. By the way, uh, we don't have, to my knowledge, we do not have a good idea where the Battle of Tours takes place at. It's somewhere in central France, probably south and west of uh, Paris. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is it's, there was no uh, battlefield commission like you get uh, the, after the American Civil War where you can go see the Battle of Gettysburg exactly where it was. Let me knock my hair down. There we go. Anyways, I, I guess I need to keep my hands off my hair. But all that to say, though, is, is that uh, Cortez, you know, Cortez, wrong guy, Ch uh, Charles Martel is going to uh, launch into and win a major victory, in fact, a climactic victory over his Moorish invaders there at the Battle of Tours in 732. The reason it's big is, is because it turns the tide. It makes Martel a historical figure. It makes his family big and important in the history of France or, or, or the Frankish kingdoms. Uh, Charles Martel is going to get a nickname out of it. It's a great nickname in history. It's uh, one of my favorites, actually. Uh, it is the nickname of the Hammer. 
His grandson is probably more likely to be known uh, to you, and his name is uh, Charlemagne. Charlemagne. Now, Charlemagne is a uh, uh, is an important historical character in his own right. It's going to be Charlemagne who helps establish and develop what is known as the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, that's more important to us later when we talk about Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation, but that's for a later lecture, not this one. So anyways, uh, Charles Martel wins the great victory. It turns the tide. It stops the uh, in Moorish invasion, and it starts to slowly but surely drive the Moors back into Spain, out of France, and slowly but surely over time drive them out of Spain altogether. Now, this is not going to happen overnight. It's going to take a while. Take a while to the point that you can already actually know the date. So on the front end, the, the great turning point, something akin to, say, the, the Battle of Stalingrad in the Second World War. Uh, after Stalingrad, that was the, the Nazi or German high tide, and after that they were uh, shunted back uh, westward, back into Germany. So in 732, however, uh, there, the high tide of the Moors was at Tours. They get turned back. The uh, last Moorish uh, stronghold is driven off of or destroyed, driven off of uh, Iberia or destroyed in the year 1492. And what we just talked about there, those years 732 to 1492 are best described uh, in your notes as the Reconquista, the Reconquista, the reconquering of Spain. Again, it doesn't take uh, over, it's not an overnight success. And there's, there are years maybe generations where warfare is basically uh, smoldering or, or non-existent. And then there's years and maybe a generation or so where it's hot as a firecracker. But slowly but surely, over the sweep of history, the Moors are driven back and out of Spain. And if you notice, uh, if you've ever been to Spain, especially it's like Barcelona and some of the Sevilla, I believe as well, uh, some of the architecture of Spain reflects the Moorish influence, uh, the long Moorish influence on that peninsula and that kingdom. So uh, the reason I bring all this up is, is that it has the, this uh, on-again, off-again relationship to uh, reconquering this, uh, Spain. And you're doing it, by the way, not just to reconquer it for uh, your family or for the crown, the, the, the Spanish crown, but you're also going to do it for religious purposes as well. The Spanish were uh, dedicated Catholics. Uh, you need to write that down. You need to understand that because one of the things I emphasize in my course is uh, religious history. So we're going to be familiar with, before it's all said and done, we're going to get familiar with Roman Catholicism uh, to some degree or another because uh, the, there's great influences in early American history by the Roman Catholic Church. And then later in this 1301 course, you'll see a great influx of uh, Roman Catholics in the form of Irish uh, and to a degree also German Catholics in the 1840s and 50s. So there's a, a great deal of influence there. But the Roman Catholic Church uh, is, is the dominant force. It is the, the religion of the Spanish. And the Catholics or the Spaniards fight and die for their faith, amongst other things, in this Reconquista. And what I want you to understand is that it helps develop a, 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 a surety. It helps develop a strength and a, uh, and the lack of uh, hand-wringing, a lack of questioning over the faith. They, they, when you fight and die uh, and you kill uh, and you uh, struggle for your faith, amongst other things, admittedly, but that's one of the reasons they do what they do, is, is it, it will bring over and take across the Atlantic Ocean when they, the Spaniards come, especially the conquistadors, that some of which we'll deal with, they, if you look at them, you find them get, uh, saying mass. You find them being religious. You find them uh, emphasizing God in addition to the gold and the glory. Uh, because some of you are very familiar actually from high school or, or another class where they talk about God, gold, and glory in the Spanish. That's true. Sometimes people want to laugh it off and say God did not matter to the Spanish. And frankly, for some of the conquistadors, that might be true. But for the overall sweep that I've read, you find religion running in the background. They may not be quoting Bible verses uh, like Cromwell would have uh, when his English roundheads go after the royalist. But the fact of the matter is, is that they are religious and they are devout and they are, are pious in their own way. They're, they're, they have the idea of sacred. Uh, and it offends them greatly when they come across, say, some of the, uh, the ghoulish aspects of the, say, the Aztec uh, civil religion, which we'll talk about later. But the fact was is that these folks, these uh, Spaniards, are going to fight and die for the religion. And, and it doesn't just affect the Spanish-Catholic uh, relationship to the Moors. 
Uh, if you've ever read Othello, the great Shakespearean tragedy, there's uh, all that in there. Uh, but it also, to be fair, too, is, is that it helps uh, produce uh, what we can call the Inquisition, which at times has been overblown and ballyhooed, and at other times was exactly what was said about it. The Spanish Inquisition, which was kind of an enforcement arm of the church, which was also th like this uh, with, the, with the crown, uh, you don't see a separation of church and state. That's an Enlightenment idea. That is a modern idea. But the Inquisition basically is going to push... Uh, a rooting out of uh, hostile elements. And so you also get, I should say this about the Spanish, you're going to get a paranoid aspect and a paranoid facet of their mentality. So uh, there's paranoia, uh, there's confidence, uh, it all goes together and you create yourself along with uh, some other f aspects of war making and, and, and uh, organization and logistics. You pr produce a warrior. Uh, you produce, sometimes you can call them a holy warrior or whatever, but you produce a warrior. All that to say, though, is, is that the Spanish are uh, militaristic. They, are, they know what they want to do. Still poor, but they are uh, militaristic and, uh, and quite good at it. So uh, anyways, but religion plays a role in our history, uh, whether it's because of exact piety and exact devotion or more particularly in the name of religion. Sometimes you get that too. People do things. So what is it that causes these impulses of discovery? Some of which is, uh, when we talk about the Spanish, is their local history, their national history of fighting off and driving off uh, the, uh, the, the Moors. And by the way, I need to mention this before I forget it. Uh, the Inquisition in Spain also made a, uh, a really, in some respects, more dogmatic, more... Uh, uh, a uh, zealous attack, not just on Moors, but maybe in more sense, they, they drive out uh, Jews out of Spain. It made it basically illegal in parts of Spain and most of Spain for Jews to live amongst Catholics if they wouldn't convert, which is an interesting and sad story in its own right. Uh, if for another class, for another subject, you could do this. But anyway, suffice to say is, is that you get an intolerance uh, in, uh, of, the, uh, of others by the Spanish. But what was it that caused a general a renaissance? What was it caused that a general awakening in Europe in the, uh, say, the 1400s and the 1500s that caused people to wake up? Well, some of it has to do with this, uh, this Muslim or Moorish invasion. I talked about it from the Western perspective very briefly. I'm going to mention it on the Eastern perspective. And if you were to pull out a map or if you know your map of Europe, you would think of, uh, say, the western part of Europe that is facing the Atlantic Ocean and the Moors coming up into Iberia and Spain kind of like a pincer on one direction. Other ways, the other way it would be, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, Constantinople coming up uh, and trying to get past there. But by the time you get to the 1200s and more especially the 1300s, uh, Constantinople has been overrun. Uh, Constantinople was a great engineering fortress, the uh, the the the, the, the Roman, if you want to call them that, or the Byzantinian defenders had finally been compromised and broken. Uh, they had forgotten how to use Greek fire. They'd forgotten how to make it. Let me get a drink right quick. Ah. So, but they've forgotten how to make it. Greek fire is some, somewhat akin to napalm. Uh, it, it's like jellyfied gasoline, but basically breaks, catches on fire, and it seemingly burns hotter under the water. Uh, to my knowledge, to this point in time, we have not figured out a Greek fire uh, alternative. Uh, it is uh, one of those uh, lost arts of the ancient world. And, but once the Moors or the Muslims get past Constantinople and are able to... Uh, uh, get into the heart of Europe and start moving up through southeastern Europe and moving up. They take Hungary. Uh, and as late as 1683, you're going to find Moorish armies, or excuse me, Muslim armies, on the doorstep of Vienna, which is in the heart of Central Europe. And so uh, for, the, for a long time period, uh, we, sometimes people will poo-poo it. But the Muslim threat to Europe was a real one. It, it wasn't constant, but it was real. And uh, one of the things you see during the... 1200s and 1100s and so forth, uh, is also a desire for crusade. Uh, you will see crusades to try to turn back the Muslim threat at Constantinople. Some sorry history and some great history is made around that city. Uh, and you also see some uh, crusades that go out to the Holy Lands to try to retake the Holy Land for Christianity. 
I should hasten to add too is, is that perhaps one of the things that's also playing in the background is, is that Europe is going to be through the 12, 1300s or so, going to be dealing with on again, off again plague, seemingly mostly on again. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a hard time, folks. It's not easy. Um, I, I can't under emphasize, I can't emphasize this enough. To be alive in the pre-modern era, and I would say modernity really gets going somewhere around 1854, 1860, something like that. Uh, but anyways, in the pre-modern era, to be alive in that time period was harsh. Uh, modern medicine does not arise until the late 19th century. Uh, right now, as I'm recording this, we're still dealing with the effects and uh, the, the waves of this pandemic uh, because of the COVID-19 coronavirus. Well, anyways, all that to say, though, is, is that uh, while we're waiting, and, and as I'm recording this, and has uh, affected my te normal teaching schedule because of it, we're hoping and waiting for a vaccine to take care of it. If it is developed uh, properly and, and effectively within, uh, in basically a year's time from the discovery of this uh, pandemic, the fact would be that would be the fastest in the history of man that a functional working vaccine would have been developed. So we'll see. Uh, but our ancestors had no such vaccines. Uh, all they had was uh, hope and prayer and, and uh, your own immune system. And sometimes it worked and oftentimes it didn't. Uh, because especially if you look at the bubonic plague, it, it didn't. Half of Europe died. Uh, but it was, uh, it was harsh. It was a hard time. Uh, not to, that's the most extreme example. But you've got smallpox, you've got measles, you've got mumps, you've got things we take for granted, tuberculosis, uh, on and on and on I could go, pneumonia, things that we don't think were deadly uh, was to our ancestors uh, perhaps a kiss of death. All that to say, though, is, is that uh, you're going to see a stirring out of the slumbers of Europe by the 1400s. Uh, also should throw in there the adventures and the writings in, of Marco Polo have a pl role to play. And so you're see looking for ways to uh, start doing trade with the Middle East. After the Crusades had kind of burned over, uh, they weren't as successful as the hopes for. They weren't as disastrous as sometimes are made out. But uh, the, instead of religious crusade, you may start looking for economic uh, travels. And so uh, Europeans will try to go to the Middle East. You'll see Europeans trying to make contact with uh, India. Uh, and even as far eastward as China, again, kind of marking the travels of Marco Polo in his 20-year journey out to the Far East. So uh, the thing is, is that going that way can be very expensive, especially if you have to go an overland route. Uh, just like you have tolls and tariffs or maybe in a more crude sense, uh, traveling through, say, Louisiana, for example, uh, you speed a little too much and you've got a Texas tag. And I'm not talking about speeding in the sense like 100 miles an hour speeding, but say if it's a 70 mile an hour road and you go 74 and you get pulled over. That is, uh, yes, you did break the, the law, the speed limit is that, but it probably also infuriated you as you looked and you watched uh, Louisianans go blowing by you at 85, 90 miles an hour. And yet the state trooper or the local county, they don't call them counties in Louisiana, but parish uh, officers, they pulled you over and they gave you a $180 ticket for four miles over the speed limit. I speak uh, from a little bit of experience there. But that's basically a toll uh, or a tax for coming through Louisiana. I might as well let others pay for it. So those, and in that similar sort of way, you're going to see men and, excuse me, you're going to see municipalities and kingdoms. A municipality would be a city or a city-state, uh, but you're going to see folks along these trade routes tax and tariff these traveling goods. So it's a cost of doing business. In Europe, in the 1400s and the 1500s, the real center of finance is going to be found in, uh, in, in, uh, in the Italian city-states like Venice. Uh, that was one of the great uh, uh, places there. So in addition to that, not only do you have the Italian city-states uh, with uh, supplying large amounts of money for these grand expeditions, they also kind of hold the keys because their interest rates are extraordinarily high. Uh, you have all this put together. Now back to Spain and to Portugal. Spain and Portugal in the late 1400s, 1400s and especially Portugal, is going to be searching for a way to get around the bottleneck of the Middle East and get to India and to get to later China. Spain is going to follow suit. They, they're rivals, but yet they're, they're neighbors on the same peninsula. How do you get there? Well, the, the easier answer might be to take a boat and start to work your way around the tip of Africa. 
Uh, it is fair to remember that in 14, the 1480s, because uh, that's about where we're going to pick up the story of Christopher Columbus in a few minutes, uh, but the, in the 1480s, nobody in the learned classes of Europe, nobody of authority, ex- I mean, with some exceptions, of course, but nobody uh, of any maritime ability thinks that the world is flat. So if you're of the opinion and you're of the thinking that, oh my gosh, in the 1480s, they all thought the world was flat and you'd fall off like a tabletop, that's not true. They knew the world was round. They didn't quite understand all the, that it was like a sphere. They may have thought it more oblong. Uh, they didn't think it was as big as it was. That's uh, important to remember. The, the size of the world is smaller in their concept of things. But flat, no, not a bit. So the Portuguese first and then the Spanish following suit are going to start to work their way down the coast of Africa. And over time, uh, especially because of some of the uh, fighting and some of the, uh, the uh, borrowing and stealing and taking, it's, it's all kind of in the same family, I suppose, between uh, Muslims and uh, Christians in the Crusades, uh, these uh, Sp- Portuguese and then later Spanish uh, mariners are going to be able to get off of the coasts, and they're not going to have to hug the coast nearly as much because of the development of new maritime technology. One uh, is uh, common and important, but, and that's the compass. But the second one, the astrolabe, is far more important. The astrolabe reads the uh, stars and charts your courses by the stars. So you're actually going east when you think you're going east. Because for those of you who have been on the, in the deep sea in the Gulf of Mexico, deep sea fishing or some other territory, deep sea fishing, and you've got out uh, 50 miles into the Gulf or whatever, you can't tell east from west, north from south. You get completely turned around in, in addition to being seasick. So uh, the astrolabe is uh, extraordinarily important because it allows you to get off the coast and allows you to really travel uh, and not get lost on the high seas and kill everybody. That, that's kind of important. By 1488, however, uh, you're going to see the Portuguese finally make their way around the tip of Africa uh, by Bartolomeu uh, Diaz, 1488 Bartolomeu Diaz. And he, the Cape of Good Hope of uh, the tip of Africa, and he's into the Indian Ocean, eventually makes contact with India, or at least uh, his uh, countrymen do, uh, and there uh, is uh, the first real successful ocean-going contact for trade with India. Uh, It is fair also to remember, too, that when we talk about trade, trade doesn't have to just be with goods and services. Uh, I say services, but goods and raw goods and finished product. Uh, There's a lot of trade going up and down the coast of Africa in this time period in the 1400s, especially the latter part of the 1400s and into the 1500s, by both Spanish and Portuguese uh, uh, traders. Uh, There's an economic benefit to this. There is really, uh, there's trade with the African uh, coastal nations, and more particularly interior tribes, uh, over gold and silver, uh, and not only gold and silver, but also human flesh. Uh, the African slave trade, it does not begin crossing the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, it actually begins in Africa with uh, Portuguese and Spanish slave traders, uh, uh, bringing back uh, slaves and settling them here or there, or whatever, just on the trade routes that they had in the local sense in the 1480s and 90s and early 1500s. You're also going to see, by the way, Muslim uh, traders coming from uh, the Arabian Peninsula in North Africa, crossing southward into sub-Saharan Africa, uh, and they too are going to trade for finished products. They're going to trade for gold and silver and for human flesh in the form of slavery. Slavery, by the way, if, you're from, uh, if you did not know this, slavery is not unique to the American experience. Uh, it is horrible in our experience, of course, but at the same time, it is not unique to us. And the fact is, is that most, to my knowledge, most every culture has a form of slavery. It just depends on what they call it and how they handle it uh, and how they go about it. But yes, slavery uh, is uh, practiced uh, well before the establishment of the United States or English colonies in the 1600s. And so the fact of the matter is, and slavery, like I said, slavery uh, was actually practiced in Europe uh, in some of the, the Moorish or Muslim invasions. Uh, there's some uh, horrible stories there too. So it's a worm in pretty much everybody's apple. All that to say, though, is, is that uh, you're making your way south. Now, that brings us to the last uh, part of our installment today, and that man's name is, of course, Christopher Columbus. Christopher Columbus in 1486, and I guess we should pick him up there. Christopher Columbus in 1486 is a, um, 
a 35-year-old explorer, audacious, determined, religious, devout Catholic. Uh, he is also a believer in himself and a believer in his grandeur and greatness. Uh, he had this uh, kind of, uh, I don't say messianic, but he certainly had this vision of glory and, grand, uh, and greatness. Well, anyways, all that to say, though, is that Christopher Columbus in 1486 is in Spain. He's in the kingdom of Spain. Spain in 1486 is uh, governed by two monarchs. Uh, it was a joint royal marriage like so oftentimes those arranged marriages could be. Uh, these two monarchs, when they got married and assumed the throne of uh, Spain to unify Spain, uh, was uh, in 1469, it's uh, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. Most of you have heard that, uh, those names before, Ferdinand and Isabella. But our interest is really with Isabella. That's going to be the central player in the, the saga of Christopher Columbus. And so Chris Columbus is going to, uh, uh, to lobby uh, Isabella for money. He's going to lobby Isabella for sailors, and Columbus is going to lobby Isabella for ships. And basically a lot of cash that uh, a moderately poor Spain doesn't have readily available, or at least doesn't have a lot of just laying around. It's not like the treasury is open and you just throw out a bag of money and it's all fine. So anyways, uh, but Columbus is, is pestering uh, Isabella for uh, sponsorship for this grand ex ex expedition. What Columbus hopes to do, and this is important to remember, I said it a few minutes ago, it bears repeating, he does not think the world's flat, he, does not, he thinks it's oblong, but he thinks the world's much smaller in it than it was. And he thinks that by traveling westward, you would be able to make contact with the Indians and uh, maybe China, and you might even find some new islands along the route, some untouched islands, perhaps for Christian development and Christian coloniza colonization, but Christian uh, uh, proselytizing and conversion, uh, certainly for economic purposes, all those sorts of things there. And that's what uh, is Columbus's hope. Uh, find new islands, make a new trade route, get away from the coast of Africa, maybe a shorter trade route, and on and on. There was, it, it was a grand vision. It was uh, so grand, people thought it was crazy. Now, it's worth remembering what a good administrator such as, uh, as uh, Queen Isabella will do in this situation. What she does is, is that she appoints a committee, as only a good individual would do. She appoints a committee. Uh, because if you're an administrator, and some of you will become administrators, you will figure out rather quickly, or you've been at church, uh, or some other organization like that, where we don't want to make a decision totally, or the man in charge or the woman in charge is like, I don't want to stick my neck out this far. So you appoint a committee to study something. And so Columbus has his uh, petition put before a committee in 1487. And uh, Columbus, long story short, is going to see this commission in this committee study his proposal. And it was a committee made up of churchmen. Uh, church is very important uh, in a political sense in Spain. But not only do they make up, uh, they're important politically and, ecclesi not, and ecclesiastically, meaning church-wise, you're also going to see cartographers, you're going to see mariners, you're going to see government or crown officials. It's a, it's a who's who. And something else you need to make note of just to remember is, is that the Spanish bureaucracy then and even into the early 1800s moves at a glacial pace. It is not fast. It does not work quickly. It is slow agonizingly slow. And there's some stories out of Texas history I could tell. Uh, I won't do it probably because this is an American history class, but there are stories out of Texas history about how long and how slow the uh, Spanish bureaucracy turns. Uh, if you've ever been to the post office, you've ever been to the, uh, probably better said, the DPS office to get your driver's license, you know what I'm talking about and how bad that can be. It's just worse for the Spanish. It's just the way they were. Well, anyways, this committee meets at a leisurely pace, and about three years later, so this would be about 1491 or so, uh, anyways, the committee comes back with a recommendation of negative. No, but not only no, maybe arguably you could say, hell no. No, this is not going to work. No, this is uh, kooky. No, this is strange. This is crankish. Uh, there's no chance. It's not, uh, no, it's just not going to happen. So, then you think, well, what does Queen Isabella do? Because you know the rest of the story. Columbus gets on the, in a boat and sells the ocean blue. And you're thinking, ah, Isabella had a moment of courage. And she says, yes, go Columbus. These, these folks don't know what they're talking about. 
wait till you get into administration. Wait until you get into a corporate structure. Wait, in, wait until you get into a bureaucratic structure. Uh, courage, in, uh, independent courage is often punished, actually, in bureaucracies, it seems like. And so, and I'm not saying the queen could have said yes on her own. She could have. I'm not saying she couldn't have. Uh, but the fact was, she, this is a youngish woman. She was in her teens when she got married and became queen in 14, what, 69. Uh, so she's still fairly young. She's not going to buck the system. These are all her, uh, some of them are her supporters, uh, knowing all the intrigue. So she basically pats Columbus on the head and said, I'm sorry, Chris, uh, we'll be in contact if we change your mind. It's the proverbial rejection letter. Some of you have gotten that email or text or however they send them nowadays. Or just maybe it was just told you after the interview, we'll be in contact. Don't call us, we'll call you. And so Columbus, realizing he'd been turned down, he gets on his trusty horse and he's headed toward uh, um, France. And he's going to try to dun the French into giving him what he wants. But somewhere around the base of the Pyrenees Mountains, that great natural dividing line between Spain and France, but at the, near the foothills of the Pyrenees Mountains, a fast rider overtook Columbus and caught him and said, Christopher Columbus, come back. The queen wants to see you. She wants to speak to you once more. And Columbus does what he's asked. He goes back. But what had taken place in the interim period of time was is that uh, Queen Isabella had basically had nights of indigestion, nights of restless sleep. And she is a devout Catholic. And she, if you know anything about the Catholic Church and the practices of the church, one of the things kid, good Catholics do is they offer penance. They, they go through uh, reconciliation. And we'll talk about that more via uh, Martin Luther. But the thing was with, with regard to uh, old uh, Queen Isabella is, is that she goes before her confessor, this Franciscan friar, and just spills her guts to him, and he basically says, call him back and start another committee. If you've got so much problems with this, uh, find out more. And so she does. She sets another committee to work, and this committee works faster, evidently about nine months. Uh, and this committee comes back with a report, and the report says, no. No, but there is an important but in the report. It basically is this. The answer is, should we spend a, a treasury of money on a far-fetched idea of going west to get east, maybe finding some islands and finding a short trade route to China or to, to India or the Indies? The answer is no, but it may work. But we don't think it's worth the spending of the money. It's not, it's, the, the risk is too great for the reward. There is, a, there is a potential reward in essence, but the risk is too great. And enter into your notes now an important name. Uh, history is sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes history is found as swinging. I, I come across this recently, this expression, and I've got a million expressions, a million uh, sayings. So, uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that when you talk about uh, Columbus, uh, sometimes history swings on the, or big doors swings on the biggest, or rather the smallest of hinges. But uh, the first hinge would have been that Franciscan friar, unknown to us. The second hinge is going to be a much bigger hinge, and he's an important man, and that man's name is Gabriel Sanchez. Gabriel like the archangel. Gabriel like the archangel. The fact of the matter is, is that Gabriel uh, Sanchez is the treasurer, the general treasurer of the kingdom of Spain. This man knows the checking account, so to speak. This man knows what Spain has and doesn't have. And he, he knows Columbus, uh, and he is aware of Columbus, but Sanchez at the nick of the moment steps up and says, by the way, your majesty, by the way, your highness, we have the money, and it is doable, and I think you should do it. Because if that man, Columbus, if that man finds what he finds, if he discovers what he says he thinks he could discover, and he gets it from somebody else, history will look at you as a faithless, and there's a religious overtone when I use the term faithless here, uh, but that you are as a faithless monarch who didn't have the guts to help out a man when he was about to make a great breakthrough. She listened to this, this uh, gigantic advisor, this important advisor. It'd be like uh, Mnuchin talking to Tr Trump, in essence. <clears throat> and it was the thing that made it. Columbus gets his ships, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. They set out. 
And about, what, six weeks, seven weeks later, they find land uh, in what basically is the Bahamas. And the thing about Christopher Columbus isn't that he discovers the new world and he's the first one to do so. I, when I was a boy, there was, a, there was a, as it turns out, as I got older, it was silly, but controversy over who discovered America first. I think it's pretty clear that the Vikings did, what was it, Eric the Red and some of those uh, Nordic explorers up around Nova Scotia and maybe um, northern Canada. They probably discovered it first, but at the same time, and that was years, years and years, hundreds of years before Columbus. But what makes Columbus important, and this is why he's important to us today, Christopher Columbus is noteworthy as a, as a Spanish explorer. He's, by the way, of course, I didn't say it. He's Italian by birth. But the fact of the matter is, is that when Columbus comes, the Spanish never really, excuse me, the English, well, they all, the Spanish, English, French, the Europeans, never leave the Western Hemisphere. They never do. They never do. Has profound impact, of course. Um, reasons we're sitting here, some of us are sitting here, if we take our heritage out of Europe, uh, is because we would be, in a sense, the lineage of uh, Columbus. And you could argue it uh, if beyond that. Um, obviously, Columbus and then later iterations as well of conquistadors and explorers, they introduce uh, grievous disease. We'll talk about that in a later lecture. But the important thing about Christopher Columbus sailing the ocean blue in 1492 and all those others uh, is, is that Columbus, who, by the way, never really understood what he he com understood what he figured what he'd come across. He, he still thought, even to this dying day, he thought he basically he was a failure uh, in some respects, a success in others. But into his dying day, he thought he was on the doorstep of India, which is or in the Indies, which is why you get the term Indians for Native Americans or the indigenous. The fact is, is that when we talk about Columbus the Europeans continue to explore. They never go away. Amerigo Vespucci is going to be the man who is going to get the, turn, the name, uh, and get the continent's name from America. Uh, it was because of a German map maker gives it to him. But the fact of the matter was they come and they never leave. Also worth noting, too, uh, this, there was a, some realization that something uh, was big here. Uh, kind of like feeling around on an elephant. They don't know all, all of what they're feeling around on uh, just yet. But in 1493 and uh, 1496, I believe it was, you're going to see what is called a treaty. And there are really two of them. Tr two of them. The Treaties of Tordesillas. T-O-R-D-E-S-I-L-L-A-S. -D -D -E -L -L Tor treaties of Tordesillas. Those treaties are between Spain and Portugal. And the, uh, the chief negotiator, the go-between, was the Catholic Church, the Pope, who was uh, memory served Spanish at that point in time. Uh, he was not in Spain. He was just a Spanish-born Pope. Anyways, pa uh, Portugal and Spain settle on what's the Treaty of Tordesillas. And this Treaty of Tordesillas, the first one and then the adjusted second one, are going to demarcate and separate the, any new lands. Everything west of this line, these, uh, these lines of Tordesillas, Anything west of those lines would be Spanish-owned. Anything east of those lines would be Portuguese-owned. Uh, there is some speculation the Portuguese had already nosed around and kind of discovered South America, so maybe that's true. I'm not going to talk more, any more about that because that is not really germane to us in American history. But all that to say, though, is if you've ever wondered where did uh, Portuguese get into Brazil, it's because of those treaties of Tordesillas. That's why Brazil has a Portuguese uh, as its uh, native tongue. So anyhow, that sets us up for a, a good stopping point. And the next uh, step on our story is the sacking of the Aztec Empire and the conquering of uh, the Western Hemisphere by the Spanish, particularly a man named Hernando Cortez. <laughs>